I'm a postdoctoral fellow in uh, initiative of, for the science of the human past here at Harvard this semester, and I'm also a lecturer here. Uh, I'll be presenting a very short um, comparison of the uh, ice core proxies of the ice core indicators for of climate with uh, our historical uh, data. And so here we return to the the oxygen isotope graph that Mickey already presented earlier, but this uh, this one plot is just slightly different because we have shifted the, I have shifted, I will take responsibility, the whole um, graph about seven years forward. Why have I done that? Because the graph indicates temperature. It's a proxy for temperature. Uh, it is not a completely straightforward uh, translation from the chemical analysis to temperature, but it's a pretty good indicator. And right here, we have the biggest temperature drop in our record. And uh, so recently, uh, there have been several studies of tetra particles and, and also ice core deposits, which have shown that the uh, volcanic eruption of 1257, originally stated 1258, but in fact 1257 from uh, Mount, the Mount Rinjani complex in uh, Indonesia created a year without a summer again in the year 1257. And that's what uh, we hypothesize this is. And again, this, these are preliminary comparisons of the uh, ice core data, scientific data, and historical data. Nonetheless, this is the, the publication that established uh, Mount Rinjani as the origin of the eruption and made the, the popular news as well. That's what it looks like, just for your eye candy factor, uh, it's still very active. And so what we're doing is, again, we're taking the ice core data, the chemical analysis of the ice core data has been done uh, by our colleagues in Maine, and we're, we're trying to compare it to the historical record uh, from uh, two modern sources. And so here we go. I selected out the data from 1200 to 1350, which includes the 1257 event. And these are historical reports of bad harvests. And you can see that there is an association, a pretty strong one, between uh, the two data sets. Again, preliminary, but still pretty good uh, association between the two. And so what we should uh, particularly take note of is this period between 1300 and 1350. In our narrative of Western history, we think of 1315 to 1325, especially in Northern Europe, as a phenomenon called the Great Famine, a period of exceptionally bad weather that marked the beginning of a colder period after the so-called medieval uh, warm optimum, which was before 1300. This would be indicated right here. And in fact, we see that if the data holds up, this is in fact a much broader phenomenon, not just a decade, but in fact, uh, more like 50 years. And the data, as we will sh see in the last slide, comes from all over Europe, not just Northern Europe. So it's a much broader phenomenon, both chronologically and geographically, of bad weather, bad harvests. And uh, there is some association uh, between the bad harvests and the temperature. And so, and the same can be said, although with less, less certainty, for the precipitation record. This is precipitation record, again, for only summer reports because Colony Fetti gives us mainly a summer signal as Paul has indicated earlier. And again, we see a, wet, a wetter period starting in 1300 and continuing compared to the previous period, continuing all the way to 1350 and beyond. Once calibrated and, and what are the implications of this for health? Well. There's been, there have been several articles, uh, this is one from a year ago by Ann Carmichael, that have posited that the increased wet conditions have increased also populations of fleas, which of course were the vector uh, for Yersinia pestis, which was uh, bubonic plague that in fact culminated in the 1347, uh, 1348 and beyond epidemic, pandemic that decimated Europe, uh, about 30 to 50% of the population is estimated to have died. 
And in fact, what Anne, was, what Anne Carmichael was uh, suggesting was that increased wet conditions may have influenced uh, the morbidity, that is, how easily the, the disease was uh, transmitted from animals to people. That's how bubonic plague um, uh, has historically been understood to, to be transmitted. Uh, through fleas jumping from rats or gerbils or other rodents to uh, people. And so she is in fact supported by our preliminary evidence here that in fact there was a wetter period and morbidity may have been increased. In addition, archaeological evidence from uh, Britain shows that in fact there is a pretty strong evidence that uh, continued malnourishment in, in European populations increased mortality. So one, if, if a person who had been malnourished for several years, maybe a decade, maybe more, contracted the disease, the Yersinia pestis, the bubonic plague, it was much more likely to die than a healthier, well-fed person. In this case, this is obviously has implications for us because we have just seen that we have bad harvests uh, which associate with uh, lower temperatures and uh, wetter conditions. So in fact, the climate may very well have created the best substrate for the plague to take root in 1347 and uh, devastate most of the population, well, a good chunk of the population of Europe. So that's the Black Death right there in time, that is. That's what 1347 is, and that's the period that we're talking about. So you can, you can clearly see that if the data holds up, and the resolution of the oxygen isotopes, which is in fact decadal, once, once uh, uh, improved by uh, further analysis, will hold up with the annual resolution of our historical data. Uh, we may very well here have substantial findings uh, that indicate that uh, all of these reports from all over Europe, all over Europe, this is the decade before the plague, uh, are in fact showing uh, a new understanding of the, of the medieval environment of, of, of the decade preceding uh, the bubonic plague known as the Black Death epidemic in this period. So those are the implications. It's very exciting data. Uh, we, l we love collaborating with our friends in Maine and we'd like to thank uh, everybody else who has contributed to this data so far, including Thomas Berkowitz who created that map and uh, undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral scholars who have contributed to this data and, and our staff.